Part 1 ready by Tokipod. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hate getting a lecture. I especially hate getting a lecture in front of everyone else even worse. They already think that I am the weakest one. This only makes them think it more. But I wanted this notebook. I wanted it bad, and I don't care what anyone else thinks about it. I'm tired of having nothing to do but run and run and run. And when I'm not running, I'm scrounging for food or other supplies the group needs and praying that I get a bit of what I help to find. Survival of the fittest and all that. The biggest and baddest always get their share first. Well, I wanted this notebook. It didn't matter that I almost got torn apart. It doesn't really matter that I got beat on again. Well, yeah, it does, but it was kind of worth it. And I didn't go down this time like I normally do. I felt righteous. I wanted something for myself, and I got it for myself. I even got myself out of the jam without anyone's help. They just saw me get in trouble is all, but I got out of it before they could decide whether they were going to take the time to help me. That's what really stunk their britches up. That for once I didn't need any of them. I mean, but still, come on, Jerry is the one that beat the crap out of me. Yet I'm the one that Moses lectured. How totally unfair is that? Sherry said that he was doing it to toughen me up. That Jerry didn't need toughening up. Jeez, no kidding. The guy makes a raw hide dog treat look like soft cheese. She added her own bit of salt to my wounds by saying that if I didn't toughen up, I was going to get left behind. But you know what? That is scaring me less and less every day. Let's see. Would I rather be chewed on by the monsters or chewed on by the monsters the guys are all turning into? Hard choice right there. I mean gross. Mr. Morris offered me an energy bar if I'd do something for him. Uh, no, don't think so. As in absolutely no freaking way, and you know where? Mr. Morris is like this old guy in his forties and I'm fifteen. You tell me there isn't something wrong with that particularly gross picture. And his breath makes me want to hurl big time. Mr. Morris isn't the only one. Some of the girls go along with one of them when they get hungry or scared. Most everyone in the group still try and pretend nothing is going on, but everyone knows. I mean, come on, sound carries, which in and of itself is a spectacularly nasty bit of information that needs bleach to get out of my brain. Only I don't have any bleach. The only thing of my own that I have I carry around in my backpack, and I've had to fight to keep that a few times. And this notebook. I've got this notebook now, too. And I've paid attention even though none of them think I have. They seem to think I'm some kind of half-wit or something. Shows what they know. I notice a whole lot more than they give me credit for. For instance, I notice the girls and women aren't any less hungry or scared the next day after doing whatever the guys ask them to do. So whatever they get from doing it doesn't last long. That's what my economics teacher would have called a high-cost, low-return equation. I may not have much, but Mom said no matter what, I could always have self-respect. Dad said self-respect and honor go hand in hand, and they have to be cultivated. Going with one of the men would be like cutting my own wrists. I'm not that bad off. Not yet. I want to go home. I want to go home so bad. I know there is no one there. I know it isn't really home anymore, but it is still a place I want to go see one more time before, if, I turn into one of the infected ones. I just want a picture of my family. Just a picture. I don't want to forget their faces, and I'm afraid I'm starting to. Is it too much to ask for one stupid picture? Mom had cleaned out her purse that day so she could take her small one, and so only had a few things with her. I just want a picture of us all together. Surely not everything has been destroyed. I'd even settle for that really bad family portrait we took when I was in sixth grade where Toddy has the leftovers from a broken nose, and I'd just gotten my braces. Maybe nothing has been destroyed. Maybe I could find not just pictures, but enough other stuff that I could make it on my own, or make it on my own until things get better. They have to eventually get better. They have to. But it is going to be a while, probably a long while, so I need to be prepared for that. We had camping gear in the garage, and my bike is in there too, 
everything but the car was always in the garage. I could fly like the wind on that bike. I can go anywhere I want. Well, maybe not anywhere, but certainly someplace away. Or at least as far away as I can get. Maybe I could take Toddy's mountain bike and head towards that place we used to go camping. There's cabins and everything up there. I'm sure Toddy wouldn't mind. It isn't like he is ever coming home from college to get it. God! Did I really just write that God? My parents would kill me, or not. Maybe they are all up there in heaven together wondering what in the heck is taking me so long to get my crap together and my head screwed on right. I'm not a little kid anymore. I know I haven't done anything to shame them, not yet, but I haven't exactly done anything to make them proud either. I haven't been a hero and saved a bunch of people like Moses. I haven't found some huge stash of food like Sherry did, although it is all gone now. I can't shoot a gun worth spit because my glasses are all scratched up. About the only thing they keep me around for is to help with first aid. But they've got Doc for the important stuff. And speaking of Doc, he's another one that is weirding me out lately. He used to be cool most of the time and weird only some of the time, now it is the other way around. He's always wanting to examine me to make sure the other men haven't been messing with me. Ooh, he wants me to sleep beside him so he can protect me. Okay, fine, I'm young, but I'm not young enough to be that stupid. Then he gets all weird when I do have to go off with one of the guys for scavenging and stuff. When I get back, he's like all over me, asking rude questions, acting, well, acting all jealous and stuff. It's not just gross, it's embarrassing. Sherry said it is because I'm the only girl that hasn't chosen a protector, temporary or not. So that's what they're, what they're calling it these days, I say back to her. She shook her head and said, I was acting too old for my britches again, and if I didn't stop, I was going to get into some trouble I wouldn't be able to run away from. Sherry ought to know. She used to be a real tough kind of person, but then she mouthed off to one of the guys, and he put her in her place. She was hurt for a long time after that, and a lot of the guys took advantage of her, making her hurt worse. She's better now, but not the same as she was, and I get the feeling she'll never be the way she used to be. Sherry is with Moses now. I guess it works for her because he treats her better than a lot of the women and girls get treated. Some of them are even jealous and try and take pokes at her, but she has toughened up enough that she won't be pushed off from him. I suppose Moses really isn't such a bad guy if you like the biker guy thing, but I don't think he ever wanted to be top dog. Or at least didn't want to be top dog the way he got there or of a bunch of leftovers. He sure doesn't like some of the people in the group and would probably kick them to the curb if we didn't need numbers to keep us all alive. Moses used to be a felon. Seriously, he told us he was like in the city jail, waiting to be taken to the courthouse when things blew apart. But he is an honest felon. He doesn't mind that my dad was a cop. Geez, that doesn't even make sense. I just mean he has his own code and sticks with it. You know his rules and follow them, then you haven't got any problems. And even though he slept around a lot, before him and Sherry hooked up, he never went after young girls and wouldn't let anyone take one if they were unwilling. That's probably the only reason I've been able to make it as long as I have. The men are all too scared of Moses to force me into anything. But I'm not so sure they are scared enough of him anymore. Moses is getting tired, and it shows. And he has to fight with the men more and more to prove he is top dog. I think he's been thinking of taking Sherry and moving on and seeing how far they can get on their own. I think Sherry has been thinking the same thing because I'm pretty sure she is going to have a baby. She pukes in the morning, but no one says anything. There's a couple of guys who could probably take Moses' place if he does take off, but I'm not sure how long they would last. Moses isn't what you would call book smart, but he is street smart. These others guys, I don't know, they think they are smart and talk about it a lot, which kind of tells me they aren't. Crud, gotta run. Looks like the infecteds have found us again. Part 2. Finally, three days of running this time, I betcha another horde is building up. 
They do that sometimes when so many get into an area. They get like this hive thing going on. They get smarter or more focused on the hunt when they get together like that. Dad used to complain that one or two bad guys could be handled, but when too many got together in the same place at the same time with the same purpose, it made for a whole lot bigger mess to deal with. Toddy used to say stupid stuff like, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but I think it might actually make sense about this stuff, kinda like the gangsta kids at school. Dealing with them one-on-one -on -one wasn't so bad. You didn't want to deal with them when they got into a group because it was like they fed off each other's bad energy and it made them worse together than they would have been separately. So bottom line, if there is a horde, you want to be someplace else and someplace else quickly. I'm so tired I should be sleeping while I can. But I can't. I'm too hungry. The men split the last of the food we had up between them, and now, if you want to eat, you have to ask one of the guys for something. Only, you know what they want, what you'll have to sell to buy a little sustenance to keep you going. Doc acts like it is only a matter of time before he can persuade me to let him examine me. He said, if I let him, he'll feed me up good. No way in H-E double hockey sticks. Even if I was desperate, I sure wouldn't give myself to some druggie. Two days ago, I caught him popping pills during the run. I thought that might be what he was doing before, but now I know for sure. If Moses finds out, he'll drop Doc over the side of a building. Head first. Drunks and druggies are like the absolute worst. They'd rather be high than alive. They always seem to be doing things that attract the puss brain's attention. Lucky for me, everyone else is just as tired as I am, and they're all sleeping. All of them. No guards tonight. If we had them, you can bet they'd fall asleep on duty. So we barricade ourselves in and do the best we can. We've had to do it before, and it worked out okay, just doesn't feel right this time. That's another reason why I can't sleep. It feels like bugs are crawling all over me. And there is enough moonlight tonight that I'm going to write as long as it lasts. Try and settle my nerves. And then I'm going to decide. First off, how did this whole mess start? Don't know. Don't care right now, either. Don't have the time or energy to care. All I know is that whatever this mess is, it took my family away and left me running for my life. I do know it seemed to pop up all around the world at the same time. Doc, before he got really creepy and weird used to talk about how impossible the odds were that something like that would occur naturally. In other words, a lot of people think, not that there are a lot of people left to think it, that it was some kind of bioterrorism. And maybe by that totally punked-up eco-terrorist group, the ones that think or thought that humans were like a plague on the planet and that there were way too many of us around. If that's the truth, bet they didn't expect for things to go quite like they have. Instead of people plaguing the planet, we have zombies plaguing the people. Yeah, yeah. I know they aren't real zombies, but close enough, all things considered. They have heartbeats and all that, but the infecteds are way strange, like mutants or something. I was out shopping with Mom when everything went to pieces. We'd come to the city to try and find a thrift store that had a modest homecoming dress or at least one modest enough that it wouldn't give Dad a heart attack and have him following me to the dance in his cruiser with the lights flashing and the siren going off. He wasn't real happy about me dating to begin with, but I told him it wasn't like I was dating, that it was only one date. One date was not dating. He didn't appreciate the difference. But it was also hard to say anything because the boy that had asked me to the dance was Kingsley for Pete's sake call me Lee before someone hears you. Barrio, who just happened to be the sheriff's son. Lee wasn't a bad guy. Actually, he was one of the good guys, but I know for a fact the only reason he asked me out was because he could say that he had to, that his dad had made him. It would have been a lie. The sheriff may have suggested it, but he would not have made him. But it kept Lee out of hot water with the three popular girls that had been fighting over him since the year before. Of course, being a guy, he didn't realize getting him out of hot water only got me into it. Wow, they were awful, and I got backed up in the bathroom a few times by those nasty she-cats. I didn't care. Well, I did, but not enough to tell Lee no when he asked me. 
No one had ever asked me to a dance before, and Lee was one of the older, popular guys in school. I was a freshman, and it would have been so cool to go to the dance with a junior. Never got the chance, which sucks, and I suppose they're all dead now. That would make me sad if I didn't think they were the lucky ones. So long as they aren't, you know, stumbling around like puss brains and stuff. Better to get chewed up completely and get it over with. Sometimes when you are fighting one off, you can tell they aren't far enough gone that they've stopped feeling pain. That's harsh. So you try and do what you gotta do as quickly as possible. Just don't look in their eyes. Makes for fewer nightmares that way. Anyway, Mom and I had gone to the city that day. It had to be a thrift store because dresses were expensive and Toddy's grant had ended and if he worked more than 20 hours a week, his grades nosedived. Dad and Mom had agreed to help him for one more year, but after that he was either going to have to find another way, like another grant or scholarship or internship or something, or he was going to have to come home, sit out a semester or two and save up the money on his own. He was the one that had chosen to go away to university instead of doing his first two years at the community college. So Dad figured he was going to have to be responsible for what the savings account my grandparents left him didn't cover. I had found the perfect dress. It fit all the parameters Dad had said it had to. It wasn't too expensive. It covered all the vital bits, both top and bottom, front and back. It was age-appropriate without making me look like a little girl. Not like that was likely because my boobs had finally come in over the summer, or making me feel like someone's granny, which was actually a bigger worry for me. And it wasn't skin-tight or made from animal print. It also couldn't be hooker red or funeral black or hoochie mama orange. Yeah, my dad really said that. He didn't just say it, he wrote it down, so I couldn't possibly pretend to forget any of it. I still have the note in a little bag I carry around my neck. It also says, Love, Dad which is more important to me than the other stuff. Dad was a good hugger, but saying the mushy stuff was hard for him, so when he did, you really remembered it. I'm glad I have that part to actually see. My dad loved me, and I'm totally cool with that. The dress was a couple of seasons out of date and had been worn by more than one person, but I didn't care. I fell in love with it as soon as I saw it on the hanger. And it was the perfect color, too. Mint. I'd always wanted a mint-colored party dress. Of course, Mom hated the color, but had to admit that Dad would probably approve. Then again, he was the man that didn't think there was anything wrong with wearing one black sock and one navy-colored sock, so long as neither one had holes in the toes or heels. Used to drive Mom up the wall. The only thing about the dress was it was asymmetrical and only had a strap across one shoulder. That meant trying the dress on just to be on the safe side. The cubicle they called a fitting room wasn't much bigger than my school locker, but at least it had a door and not just a curtain like most places. I was in there when there was this huge explosion. I was thrown against the mirror and cracked it with my forehead as I saw stars and was still figuring out if I should be scared or hacked off that the shopping day had been ruined, the lights started to flicker. I must have been in shock because all I could think about was getting blood on the dress and having to wear stitches on my face to the dance. Then I heard a lot of screaming and then a lot more screaming of a different type. I tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. I screamed for my mother. She screamed back, Don't you dare come out of there, Deandra Dawn Phillips. Don't you dare. Mom only called me by my full name when I was in serious trouble. Most of the time, people just call me D.D. I was wondering what I had done when there was some breaking glass kind of noises and something hit the door hard enough to make dust fall from the funky acoustic ceiling. Then there was more screaming that went on and on and on, but then a door slammed and things got quiet, which was somehow worse. Then the growling started, and I got scared, really, really scared. I nearly wet myself, but Mom had told me not to come out. She'd specifically ordered me. I kept waiting and waiting for her to say something else, to tell me I could open the door. Then I got smart and tried to call Dad, and when I couldn't reach him, I tried to call Toddy. I did get a hold of him, but he wasn't himself. Apparently, there had been some kind of riot on campus, and he'd been taken to the infirmary because some guy had bitten him. 
The nurse put him on the line, but he didn't seem to understand what was going on. Then the nurse took over, and I guess I freaked her out, and then we lost connection. I'm pretty sure if my brother is still in this world, he isn't my brother anymore. It usually takes less than 12 hours from a bite, and you're just another infected puss brain. Toddy was always a pain as a big brother. He gave me absolutely zero respect, but not even he deserved to be a puss brain. After a while, I tried to open that door, and it wouldn't budge. I kicked it and hit it with my shoulder. Nothing worked. That's when I kind of turned off. I remember the feeling, and it was pretty spooky. Not something I want to do again, because it leaves you too vulnerable. Sherry is actually the one that found me in that stupid dressing room. My mom or somebody had shoved a chair up under the doorknob, and then a clothing rack had really jammed it up. And the door frame was all warped. Sherry told me she almost gave up budging it. If she hadn't found me and let me out, I would have probably died in there. She's the one that made me change out of the dress and back into my street clothes. She also made me get two more changes of clothing off the racks of the store and stuff them in one of those reusable grocery bags. She's also the one that said it was going to be okay when I found my mom's purse, but not mom, and started crying again. It wasn't going to be okay, but it's what I needed to hear at the time, so I don't hold the lie against her. I looked and looked for Mom. The one place Sherry wouldn't let me look was the manager's office. She said it was really bad in there. I know it sounds awful, but I kind of hope Mom bit the bullet and isn't wandering around someplace for me to run into and have to put her out of her misery. I have no clue about Dad, but he was a cop. From what I've seen since that day, almost all of the cops and soldiers died fast and hard trying to protect people. So Chewet up or tore up that they didn't go the way of the infecteds. That was my dad's job. He protected people. Not the kind of protection Doc and the other men want to give me, though, I... Oh, crap, not again. Time to run. Part 3 Huh. What do you know I didn't have to decide after all? They left me. They just flat out left me behind. I don't think Doc meant to, but he was kind of busy getting chewed on. I know he was a creep and all, but he was nice in his own way in the beginning, so I put him out of his misery. I might be a terrible shot, but I've developed really muscular arms and a good swing. Better than I ever had when I was playing softball at school. My weapon of choice is an aluminum baseball bat that has a couple of round training weights glued to the end. All you have to do is pop the skull or take out the heart by crushing the rib cage. I suppose a sledgehammer works too but it doesn't feel as right in my hands as the bat does. The doohickey-majigger on the end of the bat means that even if your hands get slick from sweat or other stuff, the bat won't go flying away. I lost two hammers that way. Nearly hit Moses with one of them, and boy was he hacked. Before I figured out a bat would work much better. No matter what you're swinging, though, you gotta be quick because the infected's heal. And I mean heal fast and from things they shouldn't be able to heal from. I think that is why they are always hungry. They have to burn up a lot of energy doing that healing thing. I've seen them eating the covers off a leather chair. They'll eat grass mats. They'll even eat cotton clothes. Not synthetic ones, though. Anything that used to be a live something or other, they'll eat. The mess the infecteds make, their waste, Smells so bad when it is fresh. But it is so dry when it comes out, it decomposes fast and stops smelling. Or I'd have been puking every moment that passed for the last year. So if you can smell the mess the infecteds make, then you know they've been in an area real recently, within the last 12 hours or so. Their messes have made most of the water sources we used to have too dangerous to drink. You gotta be real careful about what you eat, too. Soap and water or bleach and water if you got it. If not, boil it. You keep your utensils and drinking bottle clean, or else. Infected is a really hard way to go. It didn't happen to anyone in our group, but when we cross paths with other groups, we share news and gossip and we've heard stories. Like I said, infecteds need to eat, and they'll eat almost anything that used to be live. Even carrion but they prefer the live something or others. 
The feral dogs and cats that are left in the city are mean but cautious. They've gotten good at hiding, and usually the only reason you know they are there is if they attack you first or you feel their eyes watching you as you go through their territory. Believe it or not, the infecteds have gotten to most of the rats too. When the rats haven't attacked them first, don't hack off a rat pack, especially not one that has started to consider people-shaped things as a food source, and never go below ground. Not even the puss brains go down there. I don't know if that is true of every place, but it is certainly true of this city. The bigger something is, the more likely the puss brains are to be attracted to it. Before the electric went out, there was a YouTube of some puss brains attacking a herd of elephants. I never want to see anything like that again. It gave me the runs. It even made Sherry gag. And just for chucks and giggles, the weirdos who made the whatever it is that causes the infection that makes the puss brains made it so the older the infecteds are, or I mean the longer they've been infected, the faster they heal. Their bones and connective tissues do anyway. Skin, muscle, tendons, and that sort of thing. Some stuff doesn't, like eyes, gross. A lot of them look like they've got mange, too. And a lot of them have fingernails that are missing. A doc said it was because they weren't getting the right nutrition for their condition, and that it would eventually kill all of them. It's always good to have hope. And if they get busted up bad enough but not killed, when they heal it is like a broken toy that doesn't get glued back together, right? I've seen some really freaky looking and moving puss brains. And right now I don't want to think about that too much. I'm kind of upset enough as it is. My feelings are hurt that Sherry would just dump me like she did, but I'm thinking maybe she thought I was dead or bit up. Not salvageable at that point, which is what Moses used to call members of our group that got the infection passed along to them. I wouldn't blame her if she did believe that. But if it had been her, I would have made sure to put her out of her misery. I wouldn't have left her to wander around as a puss brain for who knows how long. By rights, I should be chewed to ribbons, but I fell through the floor where it was being repaired before things went to heck in a hand basket. It knocked the wind out of me and hurt like you figured getting your boobs racked would, but it also meant the puss brains were a floor behind me, and since they couldn't move too fast on stairs, the ones that cornered us acted like they had inner ear issues, I started running. I didn't stop running until I was as far away from the developing horde as I could get. Not coincidentally, I'm pretty sure I'm heading in the right direction to go home. I also got to one of our group's caches before any of the others did. They'll get around to it eventually, but I'll be long gone by then, and so will most of what was in the pipe. A big PVC pipe that was capped on both ends. Except for the booze, they can have that. And the cigs. In the past, I've tried both to see if it would make me feel any better like the others. Made it seem like it did them. The booze just gave me a headache and queasy stomach, and the cigs stole my breath to run. So no booze and no cigs. Wasted weight in my backpack, and this thing is heavy enough as it is. Well, except for the Everclear, but that isn't for drinking. It is for sterilizing stuff. Doc used to use it to sterilize his medical stuff or what he used as e-medical stuff because he said nothing survives a 24-hour soak in Everclear. The smell alone makes me tend to believe him. Ravioli, potted meat, two canned hams, some fruit cocktail, beanie weenies, and some other canned junk should hold me for a while. Sherry also taught me about some weeds that can be eaten. I recognize them, but I keep forgetting the names. I nibbled on some wild roughage last night to keep things moving because that canned stuff totally kills my digestive tract. TMI, but true. I shouldn't feel as good as I do, but, well, I do. For one thing, I've made killer time today. I found these really cool inline skates and they've been as good as a bike. Even better because I can maneuver with them better than I could a bike. And I only took one header when I hit a crack in the sidewalk running, er, skating, from a group that had marked a whole city block as their territory since the last time we passed through there. Luckily, in addition to the skates, I found the knee and elbow pads and a helmet at the same time. 
It was in this store that sold sports and exercise equipment. I went in there looking for some tape for my bat handle. I walked out with some clean clothes, totally rocking the sports bra thing, a new rainproof jacket with a hood, and a couple of other odds and ends that I found back in the camping area. The place was a wreck, but I also managed to grab some first aid junk and some thirst quencher gum and some of those whacked out energy bars. Mom would have had a kitten over the number of carbs in these things, but hey, a girl needs some energy if she's going to run or skate away from the pus brains. I try and balance eating the carb bars and the protein bars because too many carbs and I get tired too many proteins and my kidneys feel like someone kicked them. The carb bars have a lot of sugars in them, which is why I want to take a snooze after they run out. Doc says the protein bars are hard on people's waste disposal system when they don't get enough water to help process them through. I guess I learned something from Doc after all. And I'm jazzing on one of those five-hour energy drinks. I need to sleep, but I can't afford to. Not tonight, anyway. I couldn't find a real secure place, so I've got to be my own guard since I don't have anyone to share the job with. If the map I found in the bus station is right as soon as I get on the other side of the warehouse district, I should be real near one of the bridges. The question is whether I can get across the bridges on this side of the city. The ones on the other side were blown up by the soldiers or something like that, and another one fell down when a barge hit one of the those things that hold the bridge up out of the river. I've seen the bridges, though, not up close. Moses always said it was a waste of time and energy to go that way because, even if we could figure out a way to get across the broken bridge spans, people on the other side of the river didn't want us and would shoot us to keep us bottled up with the pus brains. In the beginning, that was true. Sherry and I saw it happen before we joined Moses' group. It was so bad that people just stopped trying to get across. But I figure enough time has passed that surely they wouldn't care about one girl wanting to go home. It isn't like I expect anyone to feed me or anything. I just want to go home one more time. Part 4. Total Suckage I fell asleep and drooled all over my notebook. At least I didn't wake up to a puss brain drooling all over me. I guess I was so tired or wasted or whatever that the five-hour drink didn't work. Or maybe that stuff is getting old and losing its oomph. I know that after watching one of the girls in our group die of food poisoning, I learned to be real careful and read the labels of stuff to see when it expired. Guess I need to check the XP dates on everything again just to be on the safe side. It will give me something to do, because right now I'm not going anywhere. It's raining. And I bet you by the time it stops, it will be too close to getting dark again. I stepped out of my refuge to take care of business in the rain, and I saw quite a few puss brains heading the way I had come the day before. That's when I noticed there was an extra PU to the air despite the rain, and turned to see a great big tower of smoke coming from downtown. Something is on fire, something big. The rain doesn't look like it is putting it out. Fire is one of the things that freaked Doc out and would get him drinking. He worried that someone would start a fire, lose control of it, and it would engulf the entire city and leave us with no escape except to jump into the river and try and swim across. Then he would shudder because, of course, Doc can't swim. It was one of his phobias. But hey, Mom always said there was no loss without some small gain, and boy did I gain when I picked this office to hole up in. It didn't look like much to begin with. This area of town was kind of run down before, but since they closed the city off, it has got even worse. And there's enough people left in the city, and enough time has passed, that most places have been turned inside out for edibles and drugs. The front area had been worked over already, and I was flush, so all I was really looking for was a place to sleep. I stumbled into the back area, and it took me a while to figure out that this place must have been some kind of stock and supply business, the kind that filled vending machines, gumball machines, and candy counters. Holy diabetic shock, Batman, I hit the mother load. My brother Toddy and his friends were like junk food aficionados. Dad thought it was a riot, Mom not so much. 
Geez, those guys would come up with the craziest things in scouts. For example, their troop had this cooking contest, and one of the areas was called Microwave Breakfast. It was supposed to get the guys more self-sufficient, but I think it was just a way for them to goof off and gross each other out. Only as gross as the recipe Toddy and his team came up with it actually tasted pretty good. Even Mom admitted it. And it only took three ingredients. A small bag of Frito chips, a box of Cracker Jacks, and a little bit of marshmallow fluff. First they pulverized the chips until they were basically just powder. Then they mashed the Cracker Jacks until they were small bits. From there you added enough fluff to the Frito powder to make a really dense paste, which you then microwaved for 15 seconds. You took that out of the microwave, topped it with some smashed Cracker Jacks and a dollop of fluff, and you wound up with what they called fluffy grits with caramel crumble. It should have been totally gross. It wasn't. I later found out that it wasn't even their recipe exactly, but one they read in this book called Junk Foodie or something like that. My backpack is now so stuffed I won't absolutely have to look for edibles for quite a while. Maybe a whole three weeks. Of Course I will anyway if I get the chance. Never look a gift horse in the mouth. And food is a gift of sorts these days. People in the city are going to be starving soon. Some might already be. The puss brains will run out of people and stuff to eat, and then they'll find some way out of the city come heck or high water. Will it happen tomorrow? I don't think so, especially not with the horde to keep them entertained. Could it happen before winter gets here? Maybe, but the puss brains kind of get slow during really cold weather. Will it have happened by spring? Yeah. Yeah, I am pretty sure it will happen by then. And I want to be gone and hiding someplace safe before that happens. Guess what I ate for lunch? Never mind. You'll never guess. French onion soup. Are awful. The last time I had it was the day Mom and I... Never mind. It's a good memory, but one that hurts too much to write down. But this particular soup I ate was another one of Toddy's experiments. You take onion rings, like funions or those that Utz sells, and a small bag of Cheetos. Yes, I said Cheetos. Directions for Toddy's French Onion Soup. Place 12 onion rings in a bowl and cover them with two cups of water of boiling water. Then you mash the heck out of the Cheetos, sprinkle that over the top of the soggy onion rings, and let it sit just long enough for a lot of the hot water to get absorbed. Then you close your eyes and pretend you aren't totally grossed out and eat it. It really isn't bad. Pretty salty, though, and it makes you thirsty but at least it doesn't cramp my guts all up like eating another can of beans would. And for dessert I had what Dad used to call a virgin black Russian. You mix a bottle of yoo chocolate drink with a can of Coca-Cola and then you use a Twizzler as a straw. Mom hated them, and not even Toddy liked them. But to Dad and I they were our drink. Sometimes when he would have to work odd hours, he would come home really stressed out about a case. My bedroom was right across from the kitchen because it used to be the old laundry room, and I would hear him moving around. He would always tell me to go back to bed, but I would make us our drink, and we would sit in the kitchen and not talk. But I think it made him feel better all the same. When our glasses were empty, and we were done not talking, he would say, Better clean these up and put them away so your mother doesn't wake up to dirty dishes. We'd do what needed doing and then he'd make sure I was tucked back in bed, and he'd go slowly down the hallway. I wound up crying halfway through my dessert and blowing snot bubbles. I don't cry very much anymore, not near as much as the men in the group used to accuse me of, but once in a while you just have to let it out, or you're going to blow up. Tomorrow I'm going to have to move, whether it is still raining or not. I peeked out the back door of this place, and the fire is getting bigger. Not a lot, but it has definitely spread. In fact, I think I'm going to go ahead and pack up and see how far I can get. I can't wear my skates or I'll break my neck, but I can at least get a little further along. Maybe a lot further along. Part 5
Jerry was a jerk. He died a jerk, or will die. Well, not die exactly, but he'll probably wish he had for a while until he forgets who he is. He always said that if he got infected, he would just off himself. I'm thinking the bully is too big a coward to do it, though. He got away, but not before getting nibbled on. The smaller the dose of infection, the longer it will take him to go over to the dark side, and the more pain he'll be in until he does. I had to work to make myself feel bad about that. They never even knew I was there, thank goodness. They were making way too much noise. Moses would have slapped them upside their heads fast and hard for being so sloppy. But I didn't see Moses or Sherry. I don't know if they made it or not. Good luck to them if they did. It isn't healthy to hold grudges. I was up on the bridge trying to remember all the bragging that Jerry had done about working maintenance on the bridges, and how, even if the spans were down, there was a way for work crews to get across. There's like scaffolding that runs under the road on the edge on each side of the bridge. So it is like the blacktop can disappear, but there is still a skeleton that will help you cross. Only it is really freaky because there is no floor on the maintenance crosswalk. You have to wear these harnesses like mountain climbers do and just walk across metal beams. Holy frijole, I was ready to blow chunks just thinking about it once I'd gotten up there and seen how high everything really was. That's when I spotted them being chased by a small group of puss brains. I recognized Jerry right away because of that stupid hard hat he always wears. Once I recognized him, I recognized the rest of them, though I couldn't make out their faces. Hardly any of the old group made it, apparently. Or maybe some went with Moses, or it really doesn't matter anymore. They left me, so I've got to leave them. I bet they were following Jerry's lead and had come to do just what I was doing. He'd always said if we wanted to get out of the city, that was going to be the best way. No one really listened to him because Jerry bragged a lot. Or maybe it wasn't his bragging so much as the simple fact that he was such a jerk. For whatever reason, they were listening to him then. Only instead of making it to the bridge, they got cut off and got stuck out on a pier with nowhere left to run. They were getting a dingy off a tug that was moored to the pier when one of the puss brains broke through the group's defenses and came straight at Jerry, who had been supervising, rather than working to get it done faster. Chomp! Chomp! McDowell threw Jerry out of the boat when he tried to get in, and then those that remained started paddling with their hands to get away. Haven't the foggiest if they'll make it. Once they get near the center of the river, there is no way paddling hands are going to control where it goes. If they're lucky, it will just take them in the current and carry them off until they hit dry land somewhere down the way. If they aren't careful, though, they'll flip over where it gets rough. I was really worried that Jerry would come back and try his old plan out without the rest of them. So I opened the maintenance locker at the foot of the bridge, and sure enough, the harnesses were right where he said they would be. It took me a while to figure out how to put one on, and when I did, it was all baggy and stuff. That was like the longest four hours in my entire life. It was dark by the time I got to the other end of the bridge, and I kept expecting someone to shoot me. I was afraid to call out, and afraid not to. Especially when I saw how clear of cars and junk that the road was. Well, there were leaves and that sort of trash in the road, but nothing big. No skeletons or anything either, like if someone had been shooting at anyone that crossed the river. There wasn't any kind of sounds at all except regular old night sounds. So I started walking, carefully. The moonlight was pretty decent until the clouds came back, then I was nearly blind as a bat, so I found a building and crawled inside. It had been stripped bare, but not like someone had done it in a panic. There were broken-out windows, but I didn't know where the glass had gone because it had all been swept up. None crunched under my boots at all. I curled up in a room labeled Janitor's Closet and fell asleep. I woke up having to go to the bathroom really bad. I almost didn't make it. I was so careful about getting out in case there was someone around. Necessities taken care of it was light enough for me to really look around. I'm telling you the dead city never felt as empty as that stretch of road did. Every building had been stripped. Every vehicle had been stripped down to the metal frame. The place was so neat 
that it looked like a movie set. It was spooky weird. There was no trash any place. Not for at least three or four blocks on either side of the road the bridge fed into. I didn't go any further than that. Instead, I started walking towards home. That's when I noticed the other weird thing. It didn't smell. I mean, there were smells, but they were proper smells. The kind you would expect to smell if the world was operating sort of semi-normally except cleaner. What I wasn't smelling were puss brains. I looked around and I didn't see any of their waste. I mean, they weren't exactly shy of where they dumped, so I should have seen some. By the time the sun was straight overhead, I bet I'd gone about five miles and still no people and everything was that weird kind of freaky neat. I decided to take a chance and sat down to put on my skates. I knew from the map I was still a good forty miles from home and that I wouldn't get there in one day, but I was going to get there faster by skate than I would by feet alone. A quick hour later I noticed that things started to deteriorate. I was hitting the suburbs that were closest to the city. Here most of the houses had some kind of X or O on their front. Some people had spray-painted messages like, Gone to Grand's, or Head to Uncle Albert's. There were numbers on some of the houses, but I can't imagine what they are. Some had too many to be phone numbers, and some had too few. I had to slow down as there were more cars in the road. Things weren't totally trashed but they weren't as neat as down by the river. Then I saw a dilapidated sign hung across a big church. Red Cross Staging Area. I skated that direction, but cautiously. Hospitals weren't the healthiest places to be, and usually they were good for housing at least one or two puss brains, if not more. Inside the staging area was a mess. I didn't find any puss brains, but I did find the morgue. The bodies were like a lot that we ran across in the city. Nature had do what it was programmed to do, and there weren't any serious fluids left after a year. They weren't mummies exactly, though, more like raisins, and a lot of them looked like they'd taken what Moses called a mercy shot to the back of the head or the temple. A few took it in the forehead. A few must have done for themselves because the shot came from below the chin. You could tell where the bullet went in at because the exit hole was bigger and nastier. Sometimes real nasty. It was depressing. I don't know what I expected once I left the city, but not the emptiness I've found. I want to know where all the people have gone. They had to have gone someplace. I know a lot of people are dead. I saw that with my own eyes as it happened in the city. But if outside the city was as dead as inside the city, There'd be bodies all over the place out here, too. Not this, this, whatever it is. Maybe they've moved people to someplace safe. But around here seems pretty safe. I haven't seen any puss brains. But somebody took all of the stuff. The groups in the city salvaged, too. But they sure weren't this neat. This looks like somebody's housekeeper did it. Or somebody's mom. Kinda to the point of being OCD. I'm actually glad things are looking a little messier than they did at first. That painful cleanliness was hard to take. It was so fake. I got to sleep. Too much thinking. Part 6 They starved them. They starved the pus brains. That's why I haven't seen a bunch of live ones. They pulled back, stripped everything as they went, and then somehow funneled the pus brains toward the river and back towards the city where a lot of them came from in the first place. That is so totally freaky. I know what happened because I came to a wall. A concrete block wall made up of those big things they build the interstate overpasses with. They look like giant concrete Lego blocks and fit together just about the same way. The wall stretched for a long way in both directions. It was crap to climb, I tell you that much. Especially with my pack. I finally had to tie a rope to it climbed to the top of the wall, which was a good fifteen feet high, and then used the rope to pull the pack up to where I was sitting. I looked around from up high and saw nothing. One side of that big concrete fence didn't look much different than the other side. It reminded me a little bit of the Great Wall of China, only not as tall. It stretched as far as I could see in both directions. 
It looked like they'd used a highway so it would stand up straight. It's right without falling over. I found out later that it was also so they wouldn't have to bulldoze down any buildings as they were running out of time. I lowered my pack and then climbed down. Going down was definitely easier than going up. I decided to leave my skates off for a while and look around. The buildings on this side were stripped too, but not as neatly. Then I walked into this real estate office and I smelled it. I hadn't smelled it since I'd left the city, but I sure smelled it then. Not even that morgue had smelled like this. It felt like it took me forever to pull my bat and get ready. I was mad at myself for getting careless. Then I saw it chewing on one of those cheap Naga hide sofas, like it tasted bad, and I knew I wouldn't get a better chance. Splat! I looked around and listened, but I didn't hear another one. I was wiping my bat off with a curtain when a voice said, Thanks, kid. I turned around swinging, but didn't hit anything but wall. Damn, kid. Guess I better be glad my leg is busted or my head would be as flat as Henry's there. I looked down, and there was this man sitting in the doorway of one of the offices. He didn't look too healthy, like he was hurting in places he didn't know he had. Saw a lot of that in the city. I probably looked the same. I started to back up, and he said, What's your rush? Do I look like something to be afraid of? Look at the shape I'm in. I just looked at him. Silent type, are you? I still wasn't biting. Geez, I suck at this. Why do I always get stuck with the special cases? I snapped. I'm no one's special case. Ha, so you do have a tongue in that head of yours. A little in spite, I told him. You talk funny. Sound funny, I mean. You aren't from around here. Nope. Born in North Carolina, but I've been traveling quite a lot since then. And since we are on the subject of origins, you want to give me yours? I suddenly noticed the patch on his shirt, and tried not to get excited, but I figured I had a way to test the man in front of me. Who is the sheriff around here? No clue, kid. Liberated this from a cruiser out back a couple of days ago when some woman yacked all over me. That's when Henry here decided he wanted to dance and I busted my leg. Why are you calling that puss brain Henry? Was that his name before he got sick? Yeah. Or at least that is the name on the tag on his shirt. You probably can't see it beneath the mess you made. I had fallen silent again, losing the little bit of hope that I had. Stupid. You gonna tell me where you're from or not? Not. We just stared at each other, and I figured out he was trying to play tough. He didn't know me any more than I knew him. Are you thirsty? Hell yeah. You got any water? I took a bottle of water out of a pocket on the side of the backpack and rolled it towards him. Cautious type, huh? I shrugged, but when he started to chug the water, I told him, Ease up or you're gonna puke. He gave me an irritated look, but then nodded and set the bottle down. This all you got? You can keep it. I've got a filter. Filter, huh? Those things are only good if you've got something to filter in the first place. Take this, kid. Can't promise there isn't backwash in it, but... I said you can keep it. I know how to make do. Besides, there's an artesian fountain over by the Baptist Church on 3rd Street. All fountains and water sources were turned off and capped by order of the governor months ago. I shrugged. Unless somebody from the church did it, there's still a spigot in the baptismal. Take it you're from around here. I shook my head. A friend from school used to go there. Her uncle was the minister. That still means you are from around here close. I shrugged. He let it go. Kid, I need my pack. I got a call in. I've been out of touch for over 48 hours. Don't want to give them the idea that I up and died on them or anything. There's a Ford Explorer three buildings down on the other side of the road. Give me a hand to get over there. Or if you won't do that, at least give me a hand to get up off this floor. I looked at him and looked good. He had a buzz cut that was graying around the edges and really hard features. 
especially his eyes. They were like chips of ice. He could play at anything he wanted to, but I knew a hard case when I saw one. Are you a criminal? Hell no, kid. What gave you that idea? The top dog of the group I was with was a criminal before the puss brains attacked the city jail and he escaped. You've got the same kind of hard eyes. When the hell were you in the city? Are you telling me that's where you came from? Damn it. That means the... <sighs> He'd tried to stand up and had done something to his leg. I sighed, then backed up. Are there any more puss brains around? Sweating, he said, Puss brains? That what you call the infected people? Yeah, if you've cracked open a few, you know why. Yeah, he said in disgust. Yeah, I do. But you're too damn young to know what the inside looks like. No one is too young. You figure it out or you become puss brain chow. I repeated, Are there any more around? He shook his head. Nah, not that I've seen. This guy shouldn't have been around. This area gets sanitized on a regular basis. Shouldn't be any more. I rolled my eyes. Yeah, well, shouldn't bees still sting? He gave me a funny look and I shrugged. Something my dad used to say. He said his mom used to say it to him a lot when he was a boy. Yeah. Got a few of those rattling around in my head, too. So, kid, gonna give me a hand up? No, I'll bring your junk to you, though. If there are any puss brains around, you'll just slow me down too much. Hell's bells, I heard him mutter as I backed up and then turned out the door. I was much more cautious, sanitized or not, where there was one puss brain, there could be more. But my luck was in, and I made it to the truck he'd told me about with no problems, except for the fact that it was locked. But after being around Moses, and some of the other people in the group locked vehicles were not a problem. The Slim Jim didn't work on the truck door because it was a newer model, but punching the lock never failed. I just didn't like doing it because it was loud, in all the quiet. Fifteen minutes later, I was huffing and puffing as I dragged in the man's stuff. Geez, you got lead in this stuff or what? The guy had been attempting to crawl to the door but stopped slack-jawed when I appeared. Well, damn, kid, you really did come back. I said I would. Yes, you did. Now hand me that radio and I'll get us a ride out of here. I wasn't sure what to make of that bit of news, so I let it slide. He'd gotten kind of bent when I asked him if he was a criminal, so he probably didn't think of himself as one. I knew he wasn't a cop because he all but admitted it. But he was something and his gear looked all military and stuff. That still didn't mean doodly squat. I wasn't going to be dumb enough to take candy from a bad man. From all the noise on the other end of the radio, it sounded like whoever he was talking to was happy to hear from him. They didn't talk long, and it was mostly in what sounded like code, but he looked pretty satisfied when they signed off. They'll be here mid-morning. We'll catch us a ride and I'll get this leg looked after. I can look at it if you want me to. But no. You know, stuff. Huh? Look, I, I may not be much, but I didn't let the others drive me to that. And I learned a few things from Doc, and I can at least make sure it is set right. But not if you want something, and, and since you're a grown man, I shouldn't have to spell it out to you. Kid, you aren't making any sense. You... He slowed to a stop, and then sighed. Ah, oh, hell. I guess you are, after all. You must have had some guy mess with you. Well, I ain't that kind. If I was, Major Jeffries would have strung me up a long time ago. She and Colonel Matthews don't tolerate that kind of thing. Not for any reason. Are you in the military? National Guard, or what's left of it. Okay, but just so we're clear. And no one has messed with me. Moses wouldn't let them. If I had said yes, that would have been different, but he said girls had to be willing. The other girls did it, but I never did. It's gross. We're clear, kid. Moses, your top dog, you mentioned? He wasn't mine. He was Sherry's. 
They still left me behind, though, so don't think just because you have eyes like Moses it means anything to me. I went to work and then gave him what for. This is a total sucky job. No wonder it hurts. Nothing is broken that I can feel. You've just knocked it out of whack. And what's the big idea of cutting off the circulation? Good way to give yourself a dead leg. Okay, okay, you little spitfire. My skin is tender enough as it is. You don't need to rake me over the coals and make it worse. I snorted but left off. For a big guy, he was pretty good at not hitting out while I was hurting him, but I could tell he was in a lot of pain anyway. When I was done stabilizing the knee the way Doc had shown me, I leaned back and pulled the first aid bag out of my pack. Percocet or Tylenol? The Percocet will make you feel better, but the Tylenol won't slow you down. Or at least, not more than you already are. Tylenol. I handed him two extra strength, and he dry swallowed them. He leaned back and was breathing heavy. Then I realized it really stank, and knew I'd have to move Henry if we didn't want to have to smell him all night. I stood up and went to do what had to be done but the man reached out and grabbed my calf so fast I nearly screamed. I got loose and backed away and found myself in the worst place you could be. A corner. Hey, kid, sorry, didn't mean to scare you like that, just... I'm a little jumpy and Henry there. We need to make sure he won't get back up. He won't, I said cautiously, looking for an out. I felt the crack all the way up the bat to my hands. Yeah, well, pardon me if I would feel better when I see a bullet properly lodged where it belongs. I need my gun. No, you don't. Besides, how are you going to hit it from the other side of the counter? You need to stay put. You shoot him. I sighed forlornly. I can't hit the broad side of a barn, not even this close. My glasses are all scratched. I could hit him again, but that'll just make a bigger mess for me to clean up. Let me drag him out, and I'll put something through its heart if it bothers you that much. He gave me a weird look. You've been on the street a long time. It was a statement, not a question, so I didn't lie as I pulled Henry off the sofa and started to drag him outside. Since the first attack, or whatever you want to call it, Mom and I had gone to the city to look for a homecoming dress that wouldn't freak my dad out too much. I was going with Lee Barry O. I kept tugging and eventually got the body out to the sidewalk and then used a piece of broken furniture from the next store over to make double sure like I had told the man I would. I came back in and saw him tuck the radio back down. I looked at him suspiciously and he nodded. Yeah, I was talking to base. Gonna make something of it, kid? Not so long as that is what you are really doing. I don't want to wind up some slave girl or anything disgusting like that. Damn, you've got some imagination. You try living in the city with your only protectors a criminal, a high-priced hooker, and a doctor that is also a druggie, and you see how much trust you got. And you got a hell of a mouth on you, too. So, it's not like we're besties or anything. I don't even know your name. Watson. Sergeant Watson to you, short stuff. I'm not short. I'm height-challenged. The school nurse said so. Oh, she did, did she? He said so. Don't be so sexist. We're way beyond the 20th century, you know. Don't remind me. But he was grinning. I wanted to, but I still wasn't sure I trusted him. He kind of reminded me of some of my dad's friends, but a girl can't be too careful. Men are weird. Hey, can I ask you something? If you tell me your name... Why? Would you rather me call you short stuff? I thought it over. Dee Dee? Why was that puss brain such a light weight? He should have weighed more. Dee Dee? He started laughing so hard he bumped his leg, and then had to bite off what I figured was a lot of bad words. After he got his breath back, he asked, Seriously? Your name is Dee Dee? Yeah. It's not like I had a lot of say in what my parents picked out, so I just have learned to live with it. 
He laughed again, but then settled down as I cleaned my hands with the Everclear and dumped the scissors I had used to cut his pants in a Tupperware container and poured some of the booze over them and then put the lid on and set it aside. Who taught you that? he asked. Doc? The druggie? Yeah. So what about it? Why was Henry... Such a lightweight. I nodded, and that's when I found out about them starving the puss brains. After he explained, he said, there were too many to corral, and after the doctors explained that there was no cure for the condition, everyone agreed there were simply too many to euthanize like we'd been doing. No one really thought it was a great idea, but it was the safest one for the uninfected and the kindest for the... the ones you call the puss brains. Did anyone think there might be some people, uninfected people, still in the city? Kid? Dee Dee. Like I said, no one thought it was a great idea. And by the time they got around to it, the cities had been cut off. We thought anyone left would be one of the infecteds, and we had no way to screen people for bites and other wounds. The world was hard and it wasn't fair. I knew that, still it had sucked to be me. I guess. Are you hungry? Hell yeah. Push the rest of my pack this way and we'll split some rations. He started digging around and pulled out a sealed pouch. Hadn't even gotten around uh, to opening this up yet. He pulled the tape off, looked inside, and then made a face. That jackass Mendelssohn, he sighed. Well, kid, it ain't going to be great, but it'll fill most of the empty spaces. You want ginger ale or this lime tea crap? What else you got? Not much. He proceeded to pull out a package of saltines, a small can of Vienna sausages, a can of sterno, and a can of creamed corn. I looked it over and said, Okay. You gonna go berserk if we light your sterno in here? That's what it's for, kid. I pulled out the mess kit I had found and popped open the creamed corn and poured it in one of the pots. Pulled out a bag of fried potato sticks and crunched them up a little and put them over the top of the corn. Then dug the cheese out of a package of cheese dip and glooped that on top of the potato sticks. I wiped out the can the corn had come in and then cut some air holes into its sides. Then I lit the sterno and set the can of the top of it. When I was sure the sterno wasn't going to go out, I set the mess kit pan with the corn and junk in it on top of the can. Sergeant Watson just watched me through slitted eyes as he leaned back. I could see the pain lines around his mouth and eyes. Next, I pulled out the kebab sticks that I had made months ago, as I'd learned to make do with whatever the group let me have. I threaded the Vienna sausages on them and set them to the side. Next, I took an empty water bottle and filled it halfway with the tea and the other half with the ginger ale and mixed it together. That's gonna taste like... er... crap. It might surprise you. Soon enough, the weird dinner was finished and in our bellies. You know, kid, that wasn't near as bad as I expected it to be. Told you. Smart mouth. Yeah, well, you aren't going to like what comes next. He looked at me suspiciously. What? Did you poison me? Don't be silly. No, you gotta get up so you can go do your business. You're lucky, though. You're a guy, so all you have to do is point and shoot. Damn, kid. Part 7. Figuring out how to get him into a closet big enough wasn't the problem. It was that he insisted that I stay in there with him. Oh, no, I won't. Oh, yes, you will. No way am I going to let some scrawny, pint-sized girl child sleep off on her own when there might be infecteds roaming around. What? You're all of twelve? Twelve? Uh, I'm fifteen. Well, hello, Methuselah's grandma, and stop shouting. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. How the heck am I supposed to know how old you are? I was mad for about two seconds, and then I smiled. Okay, you just proved it. Proved what? he asked grumpily. Most guys would have looked at my chest and seen I'm more than all grown in that area. Even in the dusk I could see his face go red. 
Ah, hell's bells, kid. Don't start that kind of talk. And you're not going to distract me. Fifteen or not, you're still not going to... We went back and forth a little while, but I gave in, since he'd let me fight it out and hadn't tried to make me no matter how much he growled and threatened. Next morning we split some cold Pop-Tarts and powdered sugar donuts and chased it with some cheap knock-off orange breakfast drink. What have you got in that pack? Aladdin's lamp? You make a wish and your favorite junk food spews forth? Rather than answer him, I threw a packet of instant coffee at him. You are as bad as toddy in the morning. Flipping the brown packet around in his hand, he gave me a troubled look. Kid, this could bring you a pretty penny on the barter market. I shrugged. I've got more. It's not like I drink it. Dad would kill me. He says I can't have coffee until I'm eighteen. When I saw Sergeant Watson giving me a funny look, I thought back and realized I sounded a little crazy. I sighed. Sorry, I'm not used to having anyone to really talk to. Thought you mentioned you talked to this Sherry chick, and that you were in a group of about twenty people. Okay, let me rephrase that, I said, trying to sound like I had some sense and didn't belong on a crazy farm. I'm not used to people actually listening to what I say, so I could say just about anything and not have it mean nothing. He grinned a little reluctantly and told me, My sister the teacher would call that a double negative. I shrugged. Grammar, it's just not as important as it used to be. He nodded. Maybe not, but words can still get you into trouble and out of it. For instance, don't be so free with that stuff you keep sharing out of your pack. Save it for when you really need it. I'll keep what you gave me and be happy to, but you make sure you keep your mouth shut on the rest of what you got. We got a tight ship going, but we still have troublemakers and no goods. No need to create a situation with too much temptation. No time like the present. I never said I was going with you. He smiled, which made me suspicious. I figured you might try and pull this, and no, I'm not angry at you. I would probably feel the same way you do. Just wait until our ride gets here to make your decision. It was at that moment that his radio crackled, and they said something that basically meant that they'd be there in five minutes. Let's pack up this trash kid and hide it until you can dig a hole and get rid of it privately. We'd finish that, and then there was the sound of a couple of trucks coming down the street. Big trucks. I went to stick my head out, but Sergeant Watson pulled me back and said, Not until we know for sure. Could be anyone. You need to be more careful. I shrugged and let him lead. It was his show. Besides, Moses was always saying basically the same thing. He picked up his radio and clicked it a couple of times. Then someone clicked something back. Then he clicked it again. And then a voice called, Hey, Watson, where are you at? Got a medic, and she sure is anxious to get a look at you. All of you. I covered my mouth when I noticed how red Sergeant Watson's face got all of a sudden. The sergeant had a girlfriend. He radioed back to let him know his position, and I started edging away. Oh, no, you don't, kid. Just one more minute. Why? You can't talk me into something I don't want to do. He nodded. I know I can't. I'm hoping that someone else can, though. Not your girlfriend. Nope. I turned as the door that faced the street opened and in walked four people, while some others took up positions just outside. The first in was a long-legged blonde. Even without makeup, she looked like she belonged in a fancy magazine. She had what I was never going to have, but the smile on her face made me somehow less jealous of that fact than I could have been. There was another woman with her, and then the two guys. One was dressed in military fatigues, but the other was dressed in the kind of clothes that the SWAT team wore. Then I saw the patch, and I jerked my eyes to the guy's face. I sighed in disappointment and looked away. I didn't recognize him either. That's when he said, What's wrong, Dee Dee? Don't you know me? I jerked my eyes back to his face and he took off his Ray-Bans. He'd cut his hair short, a lot shorter than he'd ever had it. And it was done in a flat top, just like his dad's always was. 
He had a mustache like his dad, too, only it was kind of puny in comparison. I swallowed twice before any sound would come out. Lee? Then he grinned, and the hair and other changes didn't matter. Have you seen my dad? I asked. Lee's smile dimmed. I'm... I'm sorry, Dee Dee. I had promised myself I wouldn't cry, and I didn't, but it was a near thing. It's not like I wasn't already pretty certain. But I had to ask, you know? Sure, of course. I would have done the same thing, he said uncomfortably. I could feel the others watching, and it made me self-conscious. Still, I felt I had to be polite. Your dad? He's... he's working with the National Guard. Handles the local security while they handle the overall stuff. Oh. Uh, what about your mom? She disappeared in the city. My mom, too. She was working at the hospital, and... Anyway, what were you doing in the city? I mean, why weren't you at school like the rest of us? Dad said I could play hooky so that Mom and I could go find a dress for the dance. He just looked at me blankly. Homecoming? Remember? Or... Uh, maybe you don't, I guess. No, no, I remember it's just... You mean you went into the city because of me? Then suddenly it was just Lee standing there and I was just Dee Dee. Don't be a doof. Not because of you, because of a dress. And I found it, too. Would have knocked you right out of your socks. It was mint-colored and had only one strap. But it covered all the vitals so my dad and your mom wouldn't have had kittens or anything. Quietly, he said. I wish I could have seen you in it. You can. Or you could if I could find something to load my cell phone card onto. I want to go home. The last four words just sort of fell out of my mouth, and I started shaking. And I had to either shake or cry, so I just kept shaking because I sure wasn't going to cry in front of Lee Berrio. His eyes widened, and he had the nearly panicked look of a guy faced with a crying girl. Only I wasn't crying, so I can't imagine how bad he'd be if I had let the waterworks turn on. Oh, hey, sure. I'll take you there myself after Dad. Let's me off duty. He'll want to see you. You bet he will. A lot of people will. They want to know where you've been at this whole time. So do I. Why did it take you this long to decide to try and come back? We thought people would shoot us if we tried to cross the river, I whispered, trying to push sound around the lump in my throat. Not answering, though, wasn't an option. Moses had programmed that into me pretty good. There's nobody manning that checkpoint. Hasn't been for a long time. There used to be. I saw it. They shot at anything that got past the halfway point, whether it was on the bridge or on the river. Then for a while the waterside area was too dangerous because of the gangs. Lee, can I not talk about this right now? I just want to go home. I saw Lee look at the woman that was taking care of Sergeant Watson. The sergeant and the lady had been whispering. She looked at me and said, My name is Maria. Maria Ricardo. You don't look Spanish. Cuban, believe it or not. Some of us are very blonde and blue-eyed. Oh. I'd like you to come back and let me check you over at the clinic. It is kind of routine. Once you get a clean bill of health, you can go with your friend Lee here. I didn't like the sound of it, and it must have showed on my face because Lee said, It's no big deal, Dee Dee. Everyone that comes back from an outside patrol or a salvage run goes through the clinic. It's SOP so that we don't, you know? So you can't hide an infection or something like that. They don't want any potential puss brains roaming around their precious streets. The Ricardo woman said, No, we don't. Can you blame us? I shrugged. No, just don't pretend we are going to your clinic to be nice. You just want to make sure I'm not contagious. All right, I admit it. Fine. So long as we have that straight. No fake stuff. She shook her head. No fake stuff, she agreed. I jumped when Lee tried to take my pack. It's mine. I'll carry it. Okay, 
he said, putting his hands up in surrender. You don't need to make such a case out of it. Then we heard someone scream. Part 8. I said, Hey, Sarge, I think we found some more of your shouldn't bees. Shut up, kid, and keep your head down. There's almost a dozen infecteds out there. That's a big group. Oh, that's nothing. You should see how lively they get when they form hordes. The puss brains suddenly rushed the guy that had stayed nearest the trucks. Everyone else just sort of froze. What are you all waiting for? I shouted. He's going to get chomped it. We don't do something. We can't shoot. We'll hit the trucks. Who said anything about shooting? I yelled, and then ran outside and straight at the puss brains. I heard someone scream, but it wasn't me or the guy on the ground. I had already taken two out with my bat when two of the soldiers came up and started helping me. They were using those crowd control batons like my dad used to carry with him when he wore his riot gear. We were down to one mobile puss brain when the guy that had been on the ground managed to get up and yanked my bat out of my hand and wailed on him, it, until there wasn't a whole lot left above the shoulders. I tapped him on the shoulder a couple of times before I finally got his attention. Can I have my bat back now? The guy collapsed back against the truck and started yanking at his shirt. He had some kind of long-sleeved shirt on under it, and it yanked that one off too and started looking his, his arms and the rest of him. I got a good look too. Wow. Definitely closet poster material. Then the guy starts praying. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and bless the inventor of Kevlar wherever he is. I picked up my bat where the guy had dropped it, and the t-shirt too, which I felt and realized it felt like Dad's bulletproof vest. I handed it to him when Lee came up and snapped, Put your shirt on, Cochran. Stop showing off. Cochran gave Lee an irritated look. Before any more guy drama could start, Medic Ricardo stepped between them, and busted out with some orders concerning the puss brain corpses. Then she looked at me with pinched lips, but if she thought that was going to put me in my place, she was sadly mistaken. Moses was much better with the fire and brimstone than she was, and I wasn't scared of her. I walked over to find Sergeant Watson trying to get up. Damn it, give me a hand, kid, cause when I get up, I'm going to bust your butt so hard you aren't going to be able to sit down for a month of Sundays. Yeah, yeah, why the freak out? Why the freak out? You charged not one but a dozen infecteds without any protective gear on. So? They were going to chomp on that guy that fell over... Cochrane, or whatever his name is. Everyone knows the risks when they accept an assignment to go outside the perimeter. I live outside your stupid perimeter, so I don't know any other way. The rule is bash or be chomped. Moses said you don't pick fights with the puss brains, but you don't let them chomp on a buddy either. Safety comes in numbers. You let all your buddies get chomped, then you wind up all alone against a gazillion puss brains. Those odds just don't work long term. I'm getting a little sick of hearing about what this Moses guy had to say. If he was so great, why did you leave? I didn't leave, they left me. Although I was thinking of leaving, the men in the group were getting to... stuff and junk. Stuff and Jew... er... Oh, Sergeant Watson said, starting to calm down. Well... Deep subject. Smart Alec. Maybe. He sighed and shook his head, and Lee came back over and asked, What's up with you, anyway? You never did stuff like this before. Your dad would have had a lot to say about it. Maybe yes and maybe no. Zombies weren't real before. They are now. It was either change or get chomped. Or have to find some man that wanted to protect me. I don't want to be chomped, and I sure don't want to be protected. Talking like he was a lot older than he is, he said... There's nothing wrong with being protected, Dee Dee, especially when you are small like you are. I was mad for two whole breaths, but then Sergeant Watson told Lee, not the kind of protection you're thinking about. What other kind of protection is there? 
I looked at Sergeant Watson, who had an irritated look on his face, and then at Lee, who was truly confused. I said, Never mind, Lee. Guys like you and Sergeant Watson will never get it. You're too nice. Part 9 I rode to town in the back of one of the trucks, trying to ignore the looks everyone was giving me. Lee was sitting beside me and had a grumpy face on that only got worse when that Cochrane guy started talking to me. You really been in the city this whole time? Yeah. For real? When I caught him popping a pose, I had his number. Less time working the six-pack, more time developing your listening skills. A couple of the guys in the back end snorted or tried to cover their mouths. Cochran, though, only grinned after a brief surprise. Dang! You're like my grandma's chihuahua. You may be small, but you're fearless. I gave him the look that kind of stupid deserved. No girl wants to be compared to a dog. He wasn't near as smooth as he thought he was. Dad had warned me plenty about guys like that, so I decided the best thing to do would be to ignore him the same way I had ignored the men when they had started to try and sweet-talk me. We passed through two checkpoints and I got a good stare each time. I leaned over and whispered to Lee, What's with the visual third degree? Do I have something growing someplace I can't see it? He leaned over and answered, No. Word got around fast last night that you made it out of the city. You're the first since they built the wall. For some people, that's enough. Others want to know how fast the infected are going to follow you out. Probably not before winter, but maybe in the spring. I felt Lee stiffen, but before he could say something about my comment, we pulled up in front of the old walk-in clinic near the Little League fields. I jumped out of the truck, but then almost jumped back in it when three people in spacesuits came out of the clinic doors. Lee grabbed me and said, It's okay. Some folks are just extra stupid and make a big production about the sanitation process. I didn't like the sound of that. Sarge? Sarge? Whoa, kid, he said, being helped over by a couple of guys. From the other truck. You charge twelve infecteds but are scared of those three turds? Lee said sanitation. That's what you called getting rid of the puss brains. Uh, yeah. I did. Hmm. Maybe bad choice of words. Then one of the spacesuits said, You'll do as you're told. Medic Ricardo snapped, Back off. This is my clinic and... One of the other suits said, You were warned, Dr. Ricardo. Now you've been exposed. We believe that you are no longer objective, and that you have been compromised and are incapable. She hissed, Oh, for the love of... Uh. Then the first guy makes a grab for me and says, You're going to exam room one. I get a good look in the fact mask and can't help myself. Oh, I start laughing. Toby Holloway? I look at Lee and asked, Token Toby? Seriously? That's the best medical professional this place has to offer? I'm rolling, and Lee makes a face and then starts chuckling. Then he starts laughing too when the guy in the spacesuit starts cussing and making so much noise that it comes out sounding like a squawking chicken through the speaker thing he is wearing. I said loud enough for everyone to hear. Ain't no way I am letting Token Toby get his nasty hands anywhere near me. Jeez, he used to spy on the girls in the bathroom at school. Dad busted his chops twice that I know of, and told his father that it didn't matter how many laundromats he owned, that if he caught Toby lighting up or spying one more time, it was off to family court and juvie. Toby made another grab at me, and I clocked him so good in the boy parts with my bat that there was puke on the inside of the plastic mask when he finally stopped rolling around. I said I don't want your nasty hands on me. What part of no did you not understand? About that time a man came up and calmly answered, Most of it, apparently. I looked up and stood straighter. Sheriff, he smiled and said, Dandra Dawn, I wish your father could have seen this day. I see you finally learned to hit what you were swinging at. That one would have been a home run for sure. That did it. 
No matter how hard I tried, I felt my eyes fill up and overflow. But I wasn't really crying. Yes, sir, I... Did he... A drunk T-boned his cruiser going ninety. There was no time for anything else. It happened about two hours after he came on shift that day, even before we got word of what was happening in the city. I knew it had to be something for him to not answer my emergency text. I knew it. Dad would have... would have... The sheriff nodded like he was trying to contain big emotions. Yes, he would have, he agreed. Now I want you to mind Dr. Ricardo here and let her take a look at you. You know your dad would have wanted to make sure that you were okay. Lee will go with you, so you don't have to be scared. I'll be waiting to talk to you afterwards, and we'll figure out what needs to be done. But I don't want you worrying about a thing. Understand, young lady? He gave me a one-armed hug like he wanted to use two arms, but worried about pushing some kind of boundary. I nodded. What else was I supposed to do? He was the sheriff, my dad's boss, and his friend. He looked at Lee and gave him the what for glare that he'd always been good at giving. Lee said, I'll stay with her dad. See that you do, he said, though, when Dr. Ricardo, the long-legged blonde, led us into the clinic with Sergeant Watson being pushed in a wheelchair behind her. I would have thought he'd make a fuss about that, until I realized it wasn't the doctor's bouncy ponytail that he was watching. Part 10 Damn it, Lee! I told you to stay with her. Dad! She was changing her clothes! There was a squeak of embarrassed outrage in Lee's voice, but there was anger, too. I kinda remember him having fun pounding on Toby after he pulled him off me, but I went unconscious before I got to see who won. I heard the sheriff growl and wanted to say it wasn't Lee's fault, that it was partly mine for hurting Toby's pride, and that I'd been beat on harder and lived to tell the tale. But mostly all I wanted to do was tell them to go away, or be quiet, because they were making my head hurt again. As I lay there I realized there were other people in the room too. Why is she taking so long to wake up? That was Sarge. Blondie Longlegs answered, She's extremely malnourished, traumatized, sleep-deprived. And as verbally combative as she was, I didn't even dare do a sex kit on her to see if she's been sexually abused. She's talks a good line. However, she all but admits that the men in the group she was part of before they abandoned her were attempting to molest her. The sheriff growled, She said that? Not in those exact words but she appears to have some emotional stunting. She is both extremely mature, yet extremely immature for a fifteen-year-old girl. Lee muttered, That's just Dee Dee being Dee Dee. Excuse me? she asked. The sheriff explained, Wit, her father was very protective. As a cop, you see both the worst and the best of people. But mostly the worst, he sheltered his daughter. Ask the daughter of any cop and you'll probably find the same thing. But with wit, it could be pretty heavy-handed. Deandra Dawn didn't seem to be bothered by it. She never rebelled that I was aware of. Wit was always saying how proud he was of her and how she gave him and Carla so much less trouble than her brother ever did. I could hear papers flipping. And then someone else said, Todd Phillips, 19, was at university on Z-Day. I think it was the guy that had been giving me all these stupid word association and ink blob tests. That'd be him. Todd was a good kid, but he could be a peckerwood too. Too smart for his own good. He didn't have to work hard enough for what he wanted. He was the kind of kid that thrived on pranks and partying and could get away with it because he never had to study to pass the test. Drove wit crazy because he knew Todd was meant for better things than what he seemed to be satisfied with achieving. I'd never heard Toddy described better, but at the same time it bothered me to hear people criticizing my brother, even if he could be a jerk most of the time. It didn't seem fair since he can't be here to defend himself. They were still talking but moved out into what I knew was the hallway. Not everyone had left the room. 
I heard a chair pull up next to where I was laying. Did you get an earful? I cracked an eye open and said, Just tell me you pounded Toby righteously. Me and about three other guys. The NGs have him now. God help him when the Major is done with him. NGs? National Guard, Major Jeffries. That's Sergeant Watson's boss. Er, uh, yeah. I guess in a way. Not his immediate boss, but close enough. After a minute, he asked, How stupid would it be if I asked you if you hurt? Kind of stupid, but not too bad. I checked under the covers to make sure I still had clothes on and then sat up with a little help from Lee. Am I in trouble? No, why? I shrugged. Because people are weird and don't make a lot of sense these days. Oh, and I'm sorry your dad growled at you. It isn't your fault Toby is a jerk. You're right about that, but not about it not being my fault you got hurt. I should have made sure the room was secure before you stepped inside. I underestimated Toby and I shouldn't have. Or it could have been something or someone else. I made a mistake and you paid for it. Dad was right about that part. Yeah, like I was going to let you follow me when there wasn't a back on that stupid gown. Lee wouldn't look straight at me, but he did try not to grin. Then he got serious again. I'm glad you're back, Dee Dee. Were you serious about helping me go home, Lee? Yeah, but Dad will want to talk to you first. Uh, see. Slowly I asked, What? Is... is it bad? It wasn't supposed to be, and we can fix some of it maybe, but... But what? He sighed. The town turned into an evacuation point. There wasn't room for everyone. Empty buildings and houses and the stuff in them were or commandeered. I sat there trying to take in what he was saying and understand it. You mean, you mean there's someone living in my house now? That it isn't my house anymore? Yeah. I drew my knees up to my chin and hid my eyes. All I wanted was a picture. I'm forgetting what they look like. Oh, hey, Dad is going to kill me if I make you cry. I'm not crying. The sheets are wet. Shut up. Dee Dee, the furniture and stuff got used, and the food, and clothes. But personal items were boxed up and put in storage. It's supposed to be anyway. There, there's been a few problems, but we can probably find some of your stuff. No one is going to want pictures. I laid down, turned towards the wall, and pulled the covers over my head. He tried to get me to talk again, but I wasn't in the mood. A few other people tried to, too. Eventually I went to sleep and they left me alone. I woke up in the night needing to go to the bathroom. I swung my legs off the bed, but instead of floor, my feet landed on something live and squishy that grunted. Jeez, what the heck, Lee? I hissed, pulling my feet back in the bed really fast when I realized what... who... it was. Hmm. I said... I heard you. I... look. There's been a few people nosing around. They don't like the idea that someone from the city... When he stopped, I filled it in. You mean I'm, like, unclean or something? I heard him shrug. Or something? Dad has someone stationed outside your room, but I figured you might not like that, so I... Look, you got a problem with me crashing here? I looked over the edge of the bed and told him, move and don't peek. I'm in jammies. You're wearing scrubs, not, er, pajamas. I'm sleeping in them, so they're jammies. Now move. Oh, he said as I made a beeline for the door on the other side of the room. I came out and asked, how come the water still works? Huh? The toilet flushed. Oh, the town engineers hooked the old dam back up to the city power supply. It only runs part of each day, but it works. Kinda. Most of the time, anyway. The power hookup for the clinic and the school are more reliable and stay on all the time. 
Thinking it over, I said, I guess that's cool. Yeah, though, people still complain because it isn't on all the time or because certain things are on the forbidden list, like TVs, freezers, heaters, and other things that pull a lot of juice. You get caught running a forbidden item, and you get your power connection dismantled. Bet some people are mad about their Xbox, he snorted. They've got rooms set up at the school you can earn credits to use if you've got it that bad. Same for computers and stuff like that. I guess there's a lot of things that are different. Yeah, he said quietly. Trying to sound nonchalant, I told him. It's not like I really expected things to be the same, you know. Dee Dee, it's okay to be mad about your house and stuff, even if no one else understands I do. They took Laura's things and, and, and Mom's too. I felt like a jerk. I, I didn't even ask about Laura. She and Glenn. I found them. I didn't say anything to Dad, but I think they were out behind the bleachers making out, and they got caught by some infecteds. I told him that it looked like Glenn had put up a fight trying to protect her. Not that, you know, she didn't have all her clothes on. Oh, Lee. Yeah, so anyway, I just thought, if you knew about that, you'd know that. That if you wanted to talk to me but didn't want me to say anything, you'd know I could not tell anyone, I mean, that I wouldn't rat on you. I sighed. I was telling the truth. Those guys didn't mess with me, Lee. I don't care what Dr. Ponytail thinks. I'm not talking about it with her, and that's it. Sure they wanted to, but I turned them down, and it never got to where they could force me. It might have. That's why I was thinking about leaving, but they left me first. So there. Either believe me or not, I don't care. A second passed before he said, After seeing what you did to Toby out in the parking lot, I think I'll choose to believe you. Too bad you couldn't swing like that during games. Geez, thanks. No problem, I heard his jaw crack from a yawn. You mind if I catch some Z's? I'm beat. Go ahead. You should sleep too. Dr. Ricardo says you are sleep deprived. Dr. Ricardo can mind her own business. When Lee didn't answer, I realized he was asleep. I scooted out of the end of the bed and got this notebook after making sure no one had been reading it. I've written down what I wanted to write down, the stuff I think is important right now. Now I just have to wait for the sun to come up. And I'm not sleep-deprived. I'll sleep when I'm good and ready to sleep. That blonde ponytail is not going to tell me what to do. She might be able to lead Sergeant Watson around with her, you know what's, but not me.